Good morning. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Avik uh, reminded me that I was going to give the first rounds of the uh, year I'd forgotten completely, and uh, <laughs> I was very thankful for it. And at the same time, I remembered that uh, one of the residents had uh, said to me that uh, Maybe there's a tendency in Grand Rounds sometimes to have a lot of research and evidence-based stuff and that maybe we could use something a little more practical. Uh, so uh, I decided to speak on something that I think will have a lot of practical implications for the rest of your career. I think it's very useful and the nicest part about it, none of this is going to be on your board exams. The uh, structure of this lecture is going to be fairly easy. I'm going to try to make a case for why you should even care about customer satisfaction and patient satisfaction. I'm going to spend a little time talking about patient expectations because customer satisfaction is, is all about the expectations of the patients. Uh, and from that point on, it's just going to become chaotic and I'm going to speak about different ideas and different things that, that all contribute to the whole experience for the patient. Uh, and I'm going to make a very great effort to leave a lot of time at the end because I think we have a lot of experience in this room and people have a lot to say about um, their experiences with customer satisfaction. I think it would be useful to all of us to hear from the people in the room. Um, so I'm going to start with the top ten reasons to ignore customer satisfaction. Uh, but I do have to make a disclaimer that all the characters appearing in this work are fictitious. So here's the top number one uh, reason to ignore customer satisfaction. There just aren't any million dollar grants for customer satisfaction, are there? <laughs> number nine reason, it's a government plot. There's no profit in being nice. Reason number eight. Most of us have our own interests, and customer satisfaction really isn't one of our interests, and so why bother to pay any attention to it whatsoever? Reason number seven. I don't think it's part of the residency core curriculum. In fact, most of us haven't had any training whatsoever in customer satisfaction at all. Reason number six to ignore customer satisfaction. Compassion only <laughs> slows me down. I had a person I worked with who actually told me this, and I think probably that's true. <laughs> Reason number five to ignore customer satisfaction, we don't have the time. We're just too busy. Reason number four to ignore customer satisfaction, I'm too burnt out. <laughs> Reason number three to ignore customer satisfaction, well, <laughs> I'd like to see one randomized prospect of double-blind, unbiased, controlled study that proves it, that it makes a difference at outcomes. There just aren't any. Reason number two to ignore customer satisfaction, if I'm nice to them, they'll just want to come back. And the number one reason why most of us ignore customer satisfaction, what's in it for me? Why should I bother with customer satisfaction? What does it contribute to me and my career? And so the biggest hurdle, really, when you get to thinking about why we don't bother with customer satisfaction has to do with your attitude towards it, and how you think about customer satisfaction, whether you think patient satisfaction is something that's worth doing for you. So I want to take you back for a second. For some of us, it's been a few years. Some of it's been decades. But there was a day when you sat in front of someone and they asked you that question, why do you want to go into medicine? Maybe it was, why do you want to go into emergency medicine? Maybe it's, why do you want to go into nursing? But there was a point in your career when you had to answer this question of why you wanted to do what you wanted to do. Now think about it for a second. That was a long time ago for some of us. But you had some motivation. You had some reason why you wanted to go into medicine. And now, further into your career, maybe some of those reasons have changed. And so the question I'm going to ask you today is what part of emergency medicine right now brings you the most satisfaction? What is it about your job that makes you get up in the morning and get interested in going to work and gets you excited and passionate about the things that we do every day? Well, is it saving a life? I don't know. That just doesn't happen that often. I can go 
months or years without saving a life in emergency medicine. If I'm, if I'm waiting to get my passion and my, my excitement from, from trying to save a life, it's going to be a long time and, and it's going to be a hard time getting up in the morning trying to use that as an excuse to get up. Is it stamping out disease? No, I don't think so. And the reality is we very rarely stamp out any disease whatsoever. We just entertain patients until the disease takes care of itself. Is it the cutting edge equipment, the snappy uniforms? No, I don't think so. Is it the chaos? We certainly thrive on it. I mean, we love when the department's out of control and we're trying to be the captain of the ship, but that's not a reason to really get your satisfaction from emergency medicine. Is it the, the procedures? I mean, you certainly you go through residency waiting for that next intubation. But after a while, all the procedures are something that anyone could do, and you're just as willing to give it off to someone else. And you, you can't live from procedure to procedure waiting for that one thing that only you can do and no one else can. Is it the gore? No. Human suffering? No. No one gets their satisfaction from taking care of those kind of patients. On the other hand, is it chronic pain and the chronic abdominal issues and cancer and arthritis and geriatric care? Well, thankfully, there are people who, 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 who this is the core of, of their need for being into emergency medicine. But for most of us, it's, it's hard to be satisfied with your work going day to day looking forward to the next patient with chronic pain. Is it looking for some sort of complex medical problem and you're being the only one that can solve it? Well, that's another episode of House, but it's certainly not our jobs. Most of the day, we don't have any idea what patients have. We're just satisfied that we can find out that they don't have something life-threatening and send them out to someone else to sort out what's going on. In fact, the truth of it is most of what we do after a few years becomes fairly routine. And drudgery, perhaps. Uh, but it's certainly from day to day we get up and we do our jobs and there's not a lot of things that we're not competent at and seen before. But we all need some motivation. I mean, you have to get up and you have to say, what is it that makes me go and see the next patient and be excited about my job? And for most of us, it's not money. It's a little bit of achievement. It's a little bit of challenge. It's being able to do something better than anyone else and being happy about it. And so there is a challenge in emergency medicine. There's a really great challenge in emergency medicine, and it's there on every single patient. And striving for customer satisfaction is the most consistently challenging and satisfying goal in emergency medicine. Let me say that again. Striving for customer satisfaction is the most consistently satisfying and challenging goal in emergency medicine. Customer satisfaction and patient satisfaction has a bit of a bad reputation. Does anybody know what's going on in this picture? This is, this is called gavage. This is what you do when you make foie gras. You take a duck or a goose and you shove food down its esophagus. You stuff and feed it so that their liver can get large enough. And, and for many of us who've been exposed in any environment to customer satisfaction, we really feel this thing has been shoved down our throats. There, there's a feeling that, that, you know, it gets pushed on us by administration or pushed on us by, by, by hospital uh, uh, directors or, or, or the board or, or, or sometimes even if, if it's tied to compensation, there's a feeling that it's really been forced on us. In the U.S., there's the Press-Ganey survey, uh, which is forced on hospitals and they have to have certain scores or their pay is withheld. Uh, here in Canada, uh, the NRC picker is, is, is a survey instrument that's used for, for deciding what your scores are in the hospital, and the hospital board looks at these things and demands customer satisfaction from us. Uh, and uh, it, it, in, in a lot of ways, we really feel that this has been pushed on us without our input into it. Thomas Mayer, who's, who's one of the gurus of uh, customer satisfaction in the States, and if you ever have the opportunity to see him speak, he, he's incredibly motivating, defines customer satisfaction and patient satisfaction a little different than others. But he says if it doesn't make your job easier, it's not customer satisfaction. And that's a little backwards for most of us because we tend to think it of as, as something that makes our job a little more difficult, a little more time consuming, and yet he defines patient satisfaction in this way. If it doesn't make your job easier, it's not customer satisfaction. Well, the literature does have some data on customer satisfaction and says that do, some things do improve with it. First of all, compliance improves. 
when patients respect you and, and, and like what you've done and, and, and are impressed with, with the work that you've done with them, they're more likely to be compliant. And when they're more likely to be compliant, then your outcomes start improving. The, the patients take the antibiotics that you recommended to them. That leads to greater efficiency, which leads to less costs. Um, if everyone on the job is happy with their job and satisfied with it, then uh, staff morale goes up, and then you have decreased staff turnover. So your nurses are more experienced because they're not leaving to go somewhere else in the hospital where the morale is worse. That, of course, leads all around to fewer errors and reduced liabilities. All, all these are great reasons you know, to, to, to have customer satisfaction and patient satisfaction uh, as something that's very, very important to you. But I want to drop all those things because I think that for no other reason than it, it being absolutely personally rewarding for you to, to, to take this on as something that's going to be a worthwhile part of your career. I'm going to stop there and switch tracks because I want to talk about patient expectations. Because everything about patient satisfaction has to do with expectations. Um, I, I flew on WestJet on Monday morning and I expected the flights to be cancelled and, and, and the uh, uh, person at the desk said, no, no, I think we can get you on an earlier flight and, and there won't be any charge. And, and, you know, when you're expecting one thing and they just exceed those expectations, you're just so impressed with the service. So for a moment I want to stop and, and, and look at one a point that I want to make about patient expectations and I'm going to use an example here. A young mother brings in her two-year-old daughter. It's one in the morning, and the child has an earache. And you take a look. The child has a completely normal exam, except for a red, bulging, tympanic membrane. And in this case, which was a real case, I happen to know from after the fact that this mother expected three things from emergency department visit. She had three very, very specific things that she wanted from this emergency department visit. Take a minute if you have a pencil and a piece of paper or think about what those three things would be. All right. So the three things that this mother wanted specifically from this emergency department visit was she wanted oral GAN eardrops. She'd used them before when the child had an ear infection and she wanted those drops. She thought that perhaps the emergency department would have them or we could write a prescription for them. She did not have any at home. She wanted a, a sample of children's Motrin. She'd been to a clinic before and they'd given her a sample of children's Motrin and she didn't have any at home uh, and she wanted a sample of it. And the other thing that she wanted, she'd been reading in Parents Magazine that there was an antibiotic for ear infections called Augmentin. And she'd read it, it was a nice article, they had nice pictures of a child happy after their ear infection, and said that it got better, better than any other ear antibiotic, and that's the antibiotic that she wanted. So these were the three things. Well, how many people in this room got all three things correct? Put your hand up. Anybody get two of them right? What's the point I'm trying to make? You have to ask what they want. There's no way whatsoever to figure out what patients want, what their expectations are, unless you ask what they want. So there's a lot of ways of defining patient satisfaction, but in one way or another, it has to do with their expectations. People expect their expectations to be met, and if you exceed them, then they'll be more satisfied. It's fairly straightforward. We know from surveys, we know from, from the literature that patients have specific expectations. They want fast care. People don't want slow care and they want their discomfort treated. Not only their pain, they want their nausea and the other things that are bothering them treated as fast as possible. They'd like to have an estimate of the time and the course of their emergency department stay. They don't necessarily expect you to get CT scans in five minutes, they understand that, but they want to know how long it's going to take. They do have things that they have to plan around and somebody's got to take the dog out and they have to make some plans for it and so they want you to estimate the time and let them know about what kind of pattern it's going to be, how long after the scan it's going to be until they're going to have an answer. They want their opinion asked. They want you to say what do you think is going on or what do you think would help. They want you to encourage questions. You have to say please, do you have any questions? Ask me, I'd be glad to answer them. They want to have protected time. This is an odd concept for us as emergency physicians because we multitask. We're, we're, if anything, we're, we're, we're doing five different things at once throughout the, our, our evaluations. Patients don't want that. They want your time to be their time. 
uh, and they don't want it interrupted. They want personalized info. It's not enough to hand them a discharge sheet that is used for every other patient in the hospital. They want information that's specific to them, that's personalized. They want a clear explanation. Interestingly enough, they're not interested necessarily in having a diagnosis. They just want a clear explanation of what you think is going on. They'd like honesty. Uh, it's very easy to say sometimes, I have no idea what's causing your abdominal pain. That's an honest answer. Uh, but I do know that this isn't appendicitis, so it's not going to require surgery. Patients aren't looking for diagnoses a lot of time. They want some reassurance, and they want your honesty in what you found and what you haven't. They'd like courtesy. That's simple enough. And they're looking for the appearance of caring. Now, that's different than caring. No one's asking you to care for every single patient that you see. But at the very least, they expect you and they understand that, that, that you may not care about them personally, but they want the appearance that you do. And it's important to distinguish it between those two things. Well, most of us know what our expectations are when we go and speak to an airline or we go into a store. And most of the time, they meet our expectations. It's not very hard. That part of the curve is fairly flat, and almost anyone can get out of the zone of pain by, by putting in a little bit of effort and just meeting those expectations. But interestingly enough, if you put in enough effort, at some point the curve becomes very steep again, and, and you get that zone of delight. When someone makes that effort that extra effort and, and delights you, it, it, it's just so much more than just meeting expectations. And, and for a lot of us, it just requires that little extra effort in, in, a, in a little certain way to, to actually delight people and, and make them say, I, just, I, I was so satisfied with the care that I got. In fact, being a great doctor or being a great nurse or, or taking care of someone it has a lot more to do than just knowledge and expertise. There's two sides of this coin. You have to be a great communicator and you have to know how to give customer service or you will never be a, a great physician on your own. There's literature on this. Um, you know, there, there, there's lots of papers talking about what emergency medicine and patient satisfaction, what are the crossroads to it. And, and, and admittedly, the literature is horrible. Um, it's mostly studies, it's mostly opinions, there's a lot of bias and, and, and certainly I'm not even going to go into propensity curves and an area under the curve. It, it has nothing to do with those kind of things, but there's themes and the themes are fairly straightforward. There has to be good communication uh, and, and, and communication is critical uh, and, and patience and, and, and satisfaction goes up when people understand the processes that they're going under. Um, there, there's a lot of, 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 of uh, patient satisfaction literature that has to do with the perception of waiting time. It's interesting. It has nothing to do with waiting time. It has to do with the perception of waiting time. If a patient is told it's going to be four hours, they're quite satisfied if it's four hours. In fact, if it turns out it's three and a half hours, they think your care has been wonderful. Um, but uh, how they perceive that waiting time, and if you told them that it's going to be less or if, if, if during that uh, period of waiting time, um, uh, for one reason or another, it, there's that perception that things aren't happening, um, uh, their satisfaction drops off acutely. And finally, there's symptom relief. Uh, without symptom relief, most patients are dissatisfied. But there's more to it. Uh, in fact, if, if you haven't read this paper on virtue and emergency medicine, it's a discussion of all the things that make for great physicians and people who really care about their patients. And it, it, it's far beyond knowing the literature and being able to pass your board exams. It has to do with things like kindness and compassion. Sometimes it has to do with courage. Um, but there's much more to being that kind of great doctor uh, that have nothing to do with knowing uh, specifics of medical uh, data. Soroya said to me yesterday, is it a patient or is it customer satisfaction? I mean, why, why do I, I, I vacillate between the two of it? And, 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 and I want to emphasize that it's really customer satisfaction. Because if you only look at your patient, you are ignoring all the other customers that are part of what makes emergency medicine. And, and customers are every single person that integrates with the care of that patient. It's, it's everybody from who cleans the washroom or, or does the parking uh, to the person who comes down a consult to the board of the hospital. These are all customers. And so is the family and the other people who, who pick them up. These are all customers for you. And you have to be aware of all these other people so that you can provide service to all of them and not to the patient in front of you. Because if you ignore your other customers, then there's continued dissatisfaction. 
Well, um, we're not at an academic center because we just want to learn these things. You have to go beyond it and become a leader. Many of you are going to leave this institution and you're going to go somewhere where they've never heard of a concept of customer satisfaction or patient satisfaction at all. And you have to be a leader in your own way. Uh, and hopefully we're training you to be those leaders. Um, it, it, it's very important to take what you learn and, and, and perhaps at the lowest level just be a role model for it so other people see what you do and said, look, that doctor went and got a glass of water for the patient and tucked their bed in afterwards. It, it, it's, it's an amazingly powerful thing. Uh, but beyond that, if this is something that interests you, then it, it, it's very easy to pass it on and, 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 and teach the nurses and teach the other people how important it is to integrate this into your care. And again, I emphasize for the sole reason that it's personally rewarding and it makes your job easier. Uh, how many have gone into a shift and you've looked around you and, and see the other doctors that are going to be on and the people that you're going to be working with and you see the nurses and one of the nurses comes over and is so happy to see you, they smile at you and they say, we've got the A-team on today. The A-team. We all know what the A-team is. You can look around and, and say, well, we've got the A-team on today. How many people in the room here are part of the B-team? <laughs> That's an odd thing. It's called the uh, Lake Wobegon effect. Uh, if, you, if you listen to Garrison Kyler ever, he starts his show by saying that in Lake Wobegon, all the children are above average. We all sort of see ourselves as being on the A-team. That's impossible. We can't all be on the A-team. There must be some doctors that are on the B-team. None of us really see ourselves that way, but certainly it should be clear that there are doctors who just aren't capable of giving that same kind of service as others. But it's not a big deal because you get what you train for. If you live in an institution that doesn't train for customer satisfaction, then it doesn't exist. People can pick it up on their own, perhaps. We sort of have, have basics of, of what we want to do and, and how we want to do it. But you have to train for it, uh, and you have to make the effort to learn what customer satisfaction entails so that you become better at it and pass it on. And at that point, I'm going to stop, uh, and, 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 and the rest of the lecture is going to be just rethinking the emergency department experience. Some of these are random thoughts that I've had because I have things that are pet peeves and, and some of it are things that I think are very important. Um, uh, hopefully I am going to stop early so we have lots of time for discussion. Uh, but I'm going to randomly go through different ideas here that I think are very important in terms of managing um, uh, customer satisfaction in the emergency department. And, 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 and some of it's odd and obscure and just really a, a rethinking of how we do our jobs on a daily basis. One of the first things that comes up with a lot of administrations when they talk about customer satisfaction is, is your physical plant. They say, look at the emergency department. There's the walls, the paint's coming down, and the rooms, there's too small, and, and, and the place is shabby. We need to fix the emergency department. And I just want to emphasize, the physical plant has nothing to do with customer satisfaction. You know that very well. You can go into a store and have the best service in the world and has nothing to do with what's on the walls or how fancy the, the light fixtures are. Uh, and so I, I think you should leave behind the idea that, that building a better looking emergency department has anything to do with customer satisfaction whatsoever. The thing you have to fix is your patient expectations. If you can adjust your patient expectations and bring them in line with reality, then a lot of the time the satisfaction goes up very quickly without having any change in physical plan. This was one of my ideas for making it a lot easier was at the front desk when they come in for triage, just hand them a piece of paper and say, what were you expecting? Any of the following things today and have them check it off. And then at least when you walked into the room, you could look at the piece of paper and you can go, hmm, patient was looking for a pregnancy test. It would make it a lot easier. I wouldn't have to ask the question. Doesn't necessarily mean I have to give the patient painkillers or antibiotics or anything at all, but at least I can address their expectations and, and find a way to explain why I am or I'm not doing what they're expecting. Complaints are, are, are one of the greatest ways of improving satisfaction. Uh, how many people here at one point or another in the last year has had a complaint? Put your hands up high. Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, all of us have had complaints. Now, how many people here have heard about five other complaints from somebody else? 
you know, we don't really hear about other people's complaints very much. We don't share them. <laughs> oh, of course, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> But it's interesting that ministry, exactly my point, administration hears all the complaints, but they don't necessarily filter down to you. You aren't aware of what the other complaints were and how they were addressed or what was done about them, and you haven't had the opportunity really of learning from those complaints. Um, this is a uh, bulletin board at Trader Joe's in the U.S. Trader Joe's is an amazing store uh, where just it, it, it's exciting to shop there. They have so many things. The staff, the staff are, are all over you with, like, taste this, try this, you know, you know buy this. It, it, it's an amazing thing. And, 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 and I looked at this board, and it said customer comments, and I went and looked at the board, and every single one of these comments were complaints. And on every single complaint, there was an answer underneath it. Someone in their department had taken the time to answer the complaint. And it said, you know, this is a very good point. We'll try to fix this. And, and different areas of this board were complaints to different departments. Produce had their area where they were fixing their complaints. And anyone could walk up to the board, and it was so impressive. You, you would see that this, the whole organization was working to fix things. And in some cases, they'd say, no, it's not possible. This, this wouldn't be cost effective for us. But in other cases, they said, this is a great idea, and we're all going to do this. And, and, and they're just publicizing their, 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 their complaints. Wouldn't it be great if we did this out in the emergency room? We allowed our patients to complain and put it up on a board for anyone to see and show how we were trying to respond to those things? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Maybe we should actually com publish a complaint newsletter, put all the complaints together on a monthly basis or quarterly basis and show what we've done to try to address them and then distribute it, not just to ourselves. Send it out, put it out in the waiting room. Send it to our specialists. Say, you know, there was a complaint from orthopedics or radiology or from the lab or from housekeeping that we didn't clean things properly, and this is how we've decided to address it. And, and, and let them see the effort we're trying to make. You know, uh, we get these little uh, things that if we fill out uh, one of the... Uh, um, uh, lab, uh, sorry, the research papers that they, they, you know we might get a, a gift. It, why don't we hand out complaint cards? You know, you have patients that are unhappy, and you say, "Geez, that sounds like a complaint." We really like complaints here in this hospital. It says, "Would you fill this out for me? Because it has my name on it, and I could win an award if you complain." In fact, the the, the, the physician who gets the most complaints, okay, could win an award. Because we really need to take advantage of these complaints because they're how we learn to do our jobs better. Which brings us to difficult patients. Um, I, I, I certainly could spend an hour talking about the approach to difficult patients. Invite me back and I will. But for all of us, the difficult patients are sort of the bane of our existence. First of all, I want to start by saying, address the difficult patients immediately. I mean, you hear them come in the door, they're screaming, the nurses are putting them in four-point restraints, and some of us hide. These are the time bombs in your department. They're the, they're the patients that make your whole experience unsatisfactory, whether they're angry, whether they're psychotic, whatever they are, go immediately and take care of these patients. They're the patients who have those needs, and, and, and you'll feel better that you've taken care of them right away. Most of us have emotional responses to, to, to difficult patients, however you want to define them. Um, if you remember the Hulk from the comic books or from the movies, the Hulk was a mild-mannered scientist. He was the quietest, most gentle man. But when he got angry, he turned into this just monster. And it was a metaphor. That's all that the Hulk comic was, was a metaphor for all of us, how when we allow our emotions to take over, we get out of control. We all know this. I want to talk a little bit about hot buttons. <clears throat> all of us have things that ruin our shifts for us. It can be subtle. You can be in the middle of a shift and suddenly realize you're pissed off. You don't really know why sometimes. You're not sure. You're not even thinking about it. You're just sort of kicking things as you go by. Uh, but we've all had that experience where you go home and, and your, your significant other says, how was your shift? And you go, that was crap. There's something that sets us off, uh, that makes us unhappy. 
and they're often difficult patients, and you have to learn to recognize your hot buttons. Um, most of us like the TV show Scrubs, and what was really appealing about Scrubs was this concept of metacognition. Whenever JD started thinking about how he was thinking, he would have a dream sequence where he was thinking about what would happen if he did something. And, and, and that's what was appealing about the show, was you were continually understanding the way he was thinking. He, he, he would talk about it, and he would, he would voice over how he was thinking about the way he was doing things. And, and that's what learning to, to recognize your hot buttons is all about. It's, it, it's a metacognition about what's making you upset. I, I have a very good friend uh, who's a Quebecois emergency physician who works in the States right now and worked with me for years. And when, when he was young, he would become enraged during shifts. He would become so angry. And I introduced him to this concept of hot buttons. And I, and I said, Francois, you really have to figure out exactly what it is that's making you upset and write it down. And, and when he started to get the idea of the concept, he started becoming excited about it. He would call me up at home and he says, I found another one. <laughs> I, got, I got something else that upsets me. I write it down. And, and he started over time to be able to recognize it the second it happened. He knew now what it was that was, was upsetting him at the time it was, and if it was something new, he'd write it down. And, and, and then it didn't bother him anymore. And, and now, it's 30 years later, he's in a great emergency position, and he is the calmest, most controlled doctor and, and can manage absolute chaos w without any troubles whatsoever. What are your hot buttons? Well, I know what mine are. I, you know, if it, it can be patients who are, who are directly insulting to me or just rude. I, I know right away that that'll upset me. It can be confrontations with staff. You know, sometimes it's just the stupid machine not working, uh, trying to look in an ear and the otoscope bulb is out, and I just go, oh, it's so aggravating. It can be patients who, who, who pretend to be helpless when they're not really. But for you, it can be completely different things. It can be diagnostic dead ends or, or patients who are manipulative or lying or, or patients who are just so intellectually challenged they're not even capable of understanding the efforts that you're trying to make to explain what's wrong with them. And there's patients who are completely humorless, that, 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 that the whole experience is, you know, so they're, they're looking at you, what are you smiling about? Whatever it is, you have to find your hot buttons and learn to recognize them so they stop ruining your shifts. This is another random thought I had. I went to a restaurant, and, 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 and they said there's going to be a bit of a wait. Here's a pager. Why don't you go for a shop or, or, or over for a beer? The, the, the pager will work within a mile radius, uh, and we'll give you a page, and you can come anytime in the next five, ten minutes, and your table will be ready. Oh, wow, what a wonderful idea. Um, maybe we should do that in the front of the emergency department. Put in a bar. <laughs> no, I, I mean, why should the patients have to sit and wait in the waiting rooms? We know sometimes there's going to be a three-hour wait. Why couldn't we give them some sort of pager or, or text them to their phones and say, look, you know, we'll have a room. It'll be sometimes the next several hours for you. Why don't you go and go to the cafeteria or, or do your shopping, and, and, and we'll text you as soon as we know that the room is available for you, and we'll, we'll hold it for 10 or 15 minutes. We bring patients back and put them in the chair. We don't see them immediately. Why should they have to wait in our waiting room? We're lucky at this hospital we have excellent, excellent uh, um, nurse protocols that allow the nurses to do things ahead of us. But you're going to work in hospitals where, where nurses aren't allowed to give pain medications to patients before they're seen, and they're not allowed to give Gravol or Zofran to patients who are throwing up. I, I think you have to look at the symptoms that patients come to your emergency department and write policies that allow your nurses free will to, to make patients feel better from the second they hit the door. Uh, and it should all be by policy. There's just no reason why a nurse has to come to me and say, do you mind if I give this patient Tylenol? This idea of emergency medicine and performance re re really uh, hit me strong one day. The patient who came in with a headache, and she'd been seen by the resident, and, and, and the resident did a great evaluation. I'm talking a wonderful full history, physical exam, complete neurological exam, and, and, and gave me a great uh, presentation. I went and saw the patient, and she said, that, that resident was horrible. And I said, why? And she said, I have a headache, and he never felt my head. Felt her head. 
It, it, it's like, why would that have anything to do with headache? But so much of what we do has nothing to do with what we're looking for. Patients expect a certain type of performance for us. We walk in, we should be dressed as doctors, and we should do the things that doctors do. I look in patients' ears for no other reason than it's part of the performance. They have an expectation of me listening to their heart. They have an expectation of our checking their blood pressure. They have expectations of what doctors do. Take a look at their back of their throat with the tongue blade, even if it's their ankle sometimes. They have that expectation that that is good care. And so you have to consider from the moment you walk in that you're on a stage and this is a performance and that there's a certain type of expectation that they have. It takes seconds. This is not something that's difficult. And if a patient comes in with a headache, I feel their head now and go, everything seems to be fine on the outside. <laughs> And they're so impressed that I've examined their head. They say, no doctor's ever examined my head before for a headache. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about making a good first impression. This is true in all of life, but people have decided whether they like you or not, whether they trust you, whether they respect you, within seconds, certainly within minutes. They're not spending the whole time that you're in the room thinking about how good a doctor you are. They've made a very quick evaluation of whether they're going to listen to what you have to say. I, I, I spoke to residents before about why I wear a tie. I, patients have, have some sort of expectation of a certain kind of person who comes in. And so looking neat, and, and in fact in the literature there's, there's evidence that what you wear on your shoes impacts how patients perceive of you. Okay, so, so it's very, very important to make that first impression when you walk in the door uh, and, 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 and patients will decide whether they're going to listen to you and trust what you have to say based on that first minute or two. And you have to optimize that first minute or two so that you'll get the best outcomes. I want to talk a little bit about scripting. Uh, scripting has a bad reputation as well for most of us. I mean, we've called a call center somewhere and they've given us the stupid read off thing that they're reading off their computer and you know they have, have no interest whatsoever in your complaint and in fact their responses sound like they're being read off the computer and so we sort of hate the idea of scripting. But scripting doesn't have to be any of those things. I'm going to ask Krista and Krishan to come down and have a seat for a sec. Is this working? Good. Um, Krista's going to be a patient. Krishan's going to be a uh, family member. Uh, and I'm going to get a quick volunteer uh, for someone to be the doctor. Uh, and um, I, I want to just look at, just for a moment, what happens in those first few seconds when you walk in the room. Okay? Um, there's something that occurs from the time you walk in through the door until you ask that very first question uh, about... Uh, you know, why are you here in the hospital? Um, <laughs> just up to the first question where you're actually, uh, uh, you know, asking them why they've come to the hospital. Why'd you come to the hospital? <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Matt, come down. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm picking Matt on purpose. He doesn't know I was going to do this. I, 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 I'm sure you have a routine of what you do when you walk in. Just, just, just show us what your average first routine is. Average. Hello, I'm, I'm Dr. Gatier, and who's with you today? <laughs> well, tell me what's been happening that made you come to the emergency today. Okay, let's stop there. I don't like this microphone. Um, all right. I, I, I want to look at scripting for a second because I think you're wasting a hell of an opportunity. But it was obvious even immediately the difference between what Nick did and what Matt did. It, it's all right. I, we're in a hurry. And we're interested in getting to the history. 
All right. So I, I want to look just for a second about what you could do as a different and what scripting looks like. Okay. Scripting does not have to be disingenuous. Okay. It doesn't have to be mechanical. You can mean everything that you say, okay, but it can be a little bit different. So let me walk into the room and say, hi, I'm Dr. Freeman. I'm part of the team that's going to be taking care of you. Who's this with you here today? Is this a friend or family? <laughs> Both friends and family can be like that. Thank you for coming. I'm sure you're going to be a really big help. Let me wash my hands just for a moment. All right. Uh, um, before I get started, is there anything I can do to make you more comfortable? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to address all your concerns very carefully right here. You know, let me shut the door. Let's get a little bit of a privacy here. And let me sit down. And tell me, how can I help you today? Thank you. Now, I, I want to look at the aspects of that. Because if, if you look at it, it probably didn't take me more than 30 seconds. But there were, there were many different parts to what I did, which was scripting. First of all, Hi, I'm Dr. Freeman. You've got to personalize it. They want to know who you are from the moment you come in the door. You've got to shake hands or touch them if appropriate. Certainly there's times when it's inappropriate. Uh, sometimes you have to be careful about it and have to be culturally sensitive. But certainly human touch is very, very important. It can be a, a, as much as just putting your hand lightly on the, on the side of the bed may be enough. It don't have to touch them directly. Uh, but certainly if, if, if shaking hands is appropriate, it should be done. You tell them that you're part of a team. It's very important that, that they understand that it's not just you that's there to help them and that they're going to be taking care of them because they want to be taken care of. You should apologize for the wait. I, I, I started doing this initially because the waits were so long, and then I realized that if patients had been waiting five minutes and I came in and said, I'm so sorry for the long wait, they would go, what are you talking about? But they're delighted by the fact that you've apologized for the wait. And it takes you just a moment to apologize. Um, thank you for so being so patient. It, it disarms them. Sometimes patients have been waiting for hours, and they're just ready to, to, to be angry with you. And all of a sudden, you, you, you've thanked them for being patient. And the cognitive dissonance uh, makes them um, uh, you know, sort of reevaluate who you are. Um, let me shut the door. Let me shut the curtain. It, it takes you two seconds, and you should verbalize it. Sometimes you do it anyway, but you're saying, I'm doing this for your privacy. It, it makes a difference. It shows that you care about their privacy, especially in our environment where there's so little around us. You wash your hands, ideally in front of them. If you haven't done it in front of them, you can say, I just washed my hands. It says, before I start, is there anything I can do that can make you more comfortable? It, it takes so little time. And often patients are just grateful that you've asked. Sometimes they'll say, I really could use a glass of water. And if they do, go and get it yourself. It, 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 they're so impressed that you, the doctor walked out and got me a glass of water and brought it back. It, it takes me, and, and, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm in their books. I'm the person who's, who's been the big help. Um, meet and thank the family and friends. You're trying to enlist them later on. You're going to require them to help you. Um, and, and so it, it's certainly useful to get them on your side. Make sure that you sit down. It's been shown over and over again that patients' perceptions of you change immediately when you sit down. And they see that, that you're waiting and that, that you have the patience to take care of them. And then you say instead, what's your problem or why are you here? You say, how can I help today? It's a little bit different way of asking the exact same question, but it says, I'm here to help. And that makes their thinking of you completely changed. I'm going to talk a little bit about body language. And again, I probably could do a whole talk on body language, but, but your body language uh, lets the patient know that you care. Um, it, it's the way that you keep your arms open. Uh, it, it's the way that you tilt your head, the way you smile, the way you lean into them, the way you sit, uh, the way that you're open. Uh, it all, all conveys to the patient much, much more than the words that you're interested, that you're concerned, and that you're listening. Uh, things that you have to avoid are, are, are crossing your arms and, 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 and looking at your watch or your pager or your, or, or, or your, or your cell phone, um, putting your hand on the doorknob or on the curtain suggests you're just ready to go. And, and patients notice your foot position. 
position. Interestingly enough, if, if, if your feet are pointed towards them in an open manner, it suggests that, that, that you're interested. If you've got one foot pointed towards the door, it makes it look like you're ready to get out. You're not really that interested. Patients ask all the time, isn't it in my chart? They have an expectation that we know what's on their chart. And we don't always, but certainly you can make the effort to, to, to let them know that you've looked at their chart. Um, you, you, most hospitals should have some sort of database. I'm so surprised, you know, how many times have you asked the exact same questions about the past medical history and the, and, and, and the medications and the allergies? And it's the same as the last visit. Why don't we have an electronic medical record that when I walk in the room has in my hand a complete past medical history and medications and allergies and, and, and social history. I, I could say, you know, I see here that you smoke a pack a day, is that still true? But why do I have to repeat the questions over and over again? And why do I have to document it over and over again? It makes no sense to me that we don't have that availability. I spoke before about how the family is part of the, the unit, but, it, but the, it, it's really a family unit. Patients expect that they'll be taken care of, that the family's taken care of, and that they're notified and they know what's going on. Um, I, I, personal pet peeve, I, I don't know why we don't feed people. I, we, we, we don't hesitate for a second to write a prescription for medications that cost $1,000 or $100 or, and a CT scan, and yet we're not willing to give them a $3 sandwich. I, I, I can't understand why we make patients wait. And, you know, the, the airlines have figured it out. You know, I, I think for many of us, we could, if we had to, they could charge $3 when they came in the door. But I, I think to make patients sit and wait and not feed them is, is, is inhumane. Um, another pet peeve is interruptions. Um, I, I want to dedicate the time that I'm with a patient to the patient. Unless someone is critically ill, there's no reason why I should be interrupted. And everything from overhead pages to, to telephones to pagers shouldn't be part of the interaction when I'm with my patient. Um, this, interestingly enough, is a uh, uh, program that the hospital is running. Anybody here aware of this program? Oh, it's nice, a few of us. It, it, it's for the wards. It says, good night, great care. They're, they're, they're trying to have, uh, give patients on the wards a good night's sleep by being quiet at night. We don't do this in the emergency department. It's overhead pages continuously, all night long, noise, talking, things going on. We make no effort whatsoever sometimes to, to decrease the uh, uh, noise pollution that occurs in the environment. Um, this is one of the tricks that I really like. You know, how often have you said all your tests were normal? Anybody said that to patients? All your tests were normal? I, I don't do that anymore. How many tests do we do on an average patient, would you say? If you think about it, CBC, that's 15 blood tests. Biochemistry profile, it's another 15 blood tests. Urinalysis? That's 10 urine tests. On average, we're doing 50 tests on an average patient if we send off some blood and urine. And so I say that. We've done over 25 blood tests on you today. We've checked things like your liver and your kidneys and, and, and your chemistries, and all those are normal. In fact, we did another 15 urine tests on you as well, and those are normal as well. It's certainly true, and it's certainly much more impressive than all your tests were normal. I don't think I'll have the time to talk about discharging patients in the detail I'd like to, but uh, this is your grand finale. This is your performance all in one. You get to come in and be the great doctor and tell them what you're, they're thinking and, and, and go through all the, 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 the parts personalized for them. Um, to let the nurse discharge a patient is a complete waste of your performance. It would be like performing in a, in a theater show and having somebody else walk out at the end uh, and not go back on the stage. Um, for those that know me, I, I, I have my own prescription pads with my name on them, and I, I often write things on the prescription pad instead of writing a prescription. I, I, I write things for the patient so they can see my name and they have it in their pocket. They know who it was. Uh, but there's no reason. You can have your own business cards made up with your name on it and a hospital logo or, or emergency medicine specialist or anything you want to put on it and hand it out to patients and let them know who you are. And, and, and it makes them be able to say, and, and they can contact you if you want. You can have an email or something that, that allows the patient to, to say thank you for the care you've given, or wouldn't you like them to get back to you if there's been a problem? 
I've talked about this as well. There's other customers in the hospital. Every other person that you interact in the hospital is a customer, and you have to make the effort to provide them with the same satisfaction as you would with patients. There's service delays in, in, in other departments in the hospital, and, and we should be interacting with those departments to try to improve the care for our patients. You should go to meetings. Uh, if you have the opportunity, if you go to a new hospital, to, to go to a board meeting and ask the people at, at their meetings what you can do in the emergency department to provide them with better service, everything from the radiology to, 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 to psychiatry to the, the board of the hospital. I've often thought sometimes there's a, <clears throat> a type of seasonal affective disorder that occurs in emergency medicine. Sometimes in the middle of winter, or the middle of your career, you look around you and you say, I'm not so happy with all this. I'm not getting the thrill out of it. Um, but I think there's a cure for emergency department burnout, and I think the cure for it is patient satisfaction. So I want to say thank you to my patients. I want to say thank you to AVIC for reminding me I had to give this talk. <laughs> I want to say thank you for all of you who are listening, and I think I'll open it up for questions. Or comments. Please. Um, I, I think that the more the hospital uh, takes it on as part of their day-to-day -day work, the more it filters down to the people who are working. Uh, it, it's not enough to have, though, the vision and, and the intent. There has to be the leadership that has to be trained for. People have to have lectures and they have to talk about it. And it, it, it has to get into our hands. We have to, it's not enough to say that, you know, our patient satisfaction survey last month was 87% for, would recommend to another family member. That, that, that doesn't serve any of us. Um, we have to know what we have to do, what the complaints were last month. We have to know uh, what other people have done and we have to be trained for it. Uh, and, and, and at every, every level, it's not enough to train the physicians. The nurses have to be trained. The pharmacists have to be trained. The housekeepers have to be trained. The clerks and the receptionists have to be trained. I'm, I'm sorry, the, whether the... I don't know what they are. I think that whatever effort is put in towards patient satisfaction or customer satisfaction is well spent. I, I think what happens is the physicians are often the last ones to know about it and are least involved, uh, and that can be a big mistake as well. Because in some ways, even within the emergency department, uh, our, our work has to be the leaders, uh, and so we have to be involved. Obviously, Adam has made great effort in trying to get across to us the little things that make a difference from from talking to patients as they're, they're, what your name is, uh, you know, to, to saying what the hospital value and mission statement is. But it has to be continuous, there has to be a feedback loop, <clears throat> and, and there has to be the effort. And again, the effort pays off. It, it, as Tom Mayer says, if it doesn't make your job easier, it's not customer satisfaction. So I, I think the more effort you put into it, the more pleasurable it makes your job and the easier your job gets. Oh, come on, some of the old people. <laughs>
And as soon as it's uh, abusive to the clerks and the staff, we call the security and the security is not there. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Try to be confrontational with me this time today. And you're going to call the cops. Go ahead. I dare you. And it was a hard to see. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. <laughs> Yeah, so Gary's made the point that there's patients who have unrealistic expectations and how difficult it can be to, to, to address it. I, 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 I think that, that, again, dealing with difficult patients takes a lot of time and there's an effort to it. I, in no way do I say that dealing with patients' expectations means that you have to do things that you wouldn't do. If a patient wants an MRI scan right now or wants Dilaudid right now, there, there's no way that we should be providing those things. That's not realistic. That's part of the courage and, and, and those virtues that I talk about that we develop a, as physicians is, is having the ability to know what's right and what's wrong. Uh, but I, I think that not addressing their expectations and trying to make that explanation is sometimes a, a difficult thing to do. But thank you for the comment, Gary.